Senators being 207, we'll move to question time. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. Yesterday, the government announced 10,000 additional aged care home packages. Aged and Community Services Australia says the announcement, and I quote, will not even touch the sides of demand. How does the minister plan to deliver care to the remaining 110,000 older Australians who are still waiting for home care packages which have already been approved? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, thank Senator Keneally for the question. Uh, and uh, Senator Keneally is correct. Yesterday we announced a $500 uh, uh, plus $37 million package to add additional capacity into the aged care sector. Uh, and a part of that package was an extra uh, 10,000 uh, home care packages, which, which adds to the capacity that this government has continuously uh, added to the system since we came to government. When we came to government, Mr. President, there were uh, 60,000 home care packages in the system. As a result of the announcement that we made yesterday, Mr. President, there will be 150,000 home care packages in the system this year. Uh, as, as a part of the growth of the sector. Uh, and as the Royal Commission noted, Mr. President, uh, the uh, demand for home care program has continued to grow with supply. Uh, and as the Royal Commission said, it's not just a matter of uh, injecting uh, a massive number of new, new home care packages into the system, because there are other constraints and there are other issues that have to be managed. And the government's quite clearly acknowledged that they we're going to deal with those things, Mr. President. We've said that we will modify the way that uh, uh, Australians are assessed before they go into the aged care system, a single national uh, aged care assessment process. We've said that we'll do that as part of uh, our reforms of the aged care system. We've also said that we'll uh, bring together home care uh, and CHSP into one broader package, which provides additional capacity and also assists with people in ensuring they get care. The government has acknowledged, Mr. President, there is still more work to do. There is still more work to do. But, Mr. President, Order. I'm not going to be lectured by the Labor Party, who at the last election added $387 billion worth of taxes and did not put one single home care package on the table. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. How does the minister respond to leading age services Australia? who say the government's announcement to fund an extra 10,000 home care packages is, quote, a missed opportunity, wow. which will disappoint the remaining 110,000 elderly Australians on the wait list in the lead up to Christmas. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. I shall say to Leading Aid Services Australia, as, as I have done on the phone in the conversation, exactly what I've just said to the chamber. We will work through our way through this process in a methodical manner. We're not going to do what the Labor Party did when they were in government, creating a circumstance where you have a pink bats that uh, ended up unfortunately well, order. killing people. Senator, we are Wong, going to Senator work Colbeck, Senator Wong, on a point of order. Point of order is direct relevance. This is a serious topic. You made some rulings yesterday in relation to Senator Rustin's answers. Order. No, I people point of dying order. whilst waiting for approved packages is pretty serious, and he ought to answer the question rather than playing it, it politics. I'll take, order, I'll take the order, interjection Senator, from Senator 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 People, 16,000 Australians Wong, died resume waiting. Your seat. Sen order. Order. Interjections and responses to them are inappropriate, I might say particularly during points of order. On the ruling I made yesterday, I'm not going to interrupt the minister halfway through a sentence. Um, the minister was asked how he responded to a series of claims. I was listening carefully to his answer. I believe he was being directly relevant. And while a glancing comment may be in order, a glancing comment, I do consider a tightly worded question, as was the case yesterday, did preclude discussion of opposition policy. I'm not willing to necessarily make that ruling now because I don't believe the minister has gone there at this point. He was halfway through a sentence. Senator Colbeck, I'll call you to continue. Thank you, Mr. President. So the government will do as it said when the Royal Commission was announced. 
uh, when the draft report was released a couple of weeks ago uh, and in our press conference yesterday. We said that we will methodically work through all of the issues that we need to deal with as part of this process. As I've said a number of times, we have increased the capacity of the home care sector from 60,000 places when we came to government to 150,000 places this year, an investment of $2.7 billion since last year's budget. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. National Seniors Australia says the government's 10,000 extra home care packages is, and I quote, less than the number of people who died last year waiting for a package. In 2017-18, 16,000 older Australians died waiting to receive their home care Shame. package. Shame. How many more older Australians will die waiting for their approved home care package? Shame. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and as I said to um, Seniors Australia when I was talking to them this morning, uh, I outlined the process that we were going through and the issues that we're going to deal with, Mr. President. And, Mr. President, the suggestion that uh, and, and these people is, that have unfortunately passed away while they're waiting for their aged care package uh, have, have had no access to any health care at all is quite simply a false premise. Uh, Mr President, uh, all Australians have access to Australia's health system quite appropriately. And so while they are waiting for an aged care package, 97 per cent of those who haven't received the package that they've been allotted have access, for example, to some home care services through programs Order like CHSP. On my left. So they are Order receiving on some my sort form of care. And of course, Mr President, they have access to the Australian Senator health care Watt. system. Hospitals, GPs Senator and all Watt, of the other take facilities a breath when I mention your name. Senator Van. Thank you, Mr. President. Order. Order on my left. Senator Van is on his feet. Senator Van. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Building on the government's response to the Royal Commission into Aged Care's interim report, can the minister please advise the Senate about the amendments to the Quality of Care Principles 2014? regulation of restraint in residential aged care facilities, which have been tabled in the Senate today, to further minimise the use of restraint in aged care. The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. Thank, thank you, Mr President, uh, and thanks, Senator Van, for the question. Mr President, the government believes that uh, the health, safety and wellbeing of older Australians who reside in aged care services is of paramount importance to the government. Uh, and the use of restraint should always be the last resort. On the 1st of July 2019, the government delivered new restraint regulations that put explicit obligations on residential aged care providers in respect of the use of, of restraints. We've already taken action to minimise the use of physical and chemical restraint in aged care homes. Regulations that came into July and 1st of July put explicit obligation on those providers. These regulatory changes require providers to satisfy a number of conditions before restraint can be used, including assessment by a medical practitioner or nurse practitioner who has prescribed the medication for medical restraint. Further, where restraint is used, providers must monitor the consumer for signs of distress or harm. Mr President, today we're strengthening those regulations relating to chemical restraints. These changes will do a number of things, Mr. President. They will make it clear that restraint must always be the last resort. They will clarify state and territory legislative responsibility for prescribers to gain informed consent on restraint. And Mr. President, because we, are, we acknowledge that there are some concerns around the regulation and that the regulations need to be at the leading edge, we've put in place a review process that will start on 1 July next year, running through until the end of December next year, uh, with the sunset clause on the regulations which will allow for any reforms that come out of the review process, including the recommendation of the Royal Commission, to be incorporated into new regulations. Senator Van, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. What else has the government done to minimise the use of restraints in aged care? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And as part of our announcement yesterday, uh, the Health Minister made a number of announcements with respect to the prescription of uh, anti-psychotropics, uh, anti um, risperidone being the key one. 
uh, and also uh, antipsychotics. Um, and so, from the 1st of January, off the back of the recommendations from the Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Committee, prescriptions for risperidone will be restricted, and doctors will be required to apply for additional approval of if risperidone is to be prescribed beyond the initial 12 weeks. Mr. President, we've also put an additional $10 million into uh, dementia may management and behaviour and training capacity. Mr. President, this adds to the $37 million that's being spent this year for uh, those programs. So, from $37 million this year, it will go to $45 million in 2019-20. Senator Van, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister please outline the government's record on aged care funding? Senator Colbeck. Listen carefully. Senator Colbeck. Order on my left. Order. Mr President, the government is continuing to deliver record investment into the aged care sector across the forward estimates from $13.3 billion in 2012 Order. Senator Watt. Labor, uh, under Labor, to $21.7 billion in 2019-20 and to an estimate $25.4 billion in 2022-23. That's on average, Mr. President, one billion dollars of extra support for older Australians each year. Not even the ABC believes you, Senator. Not Senator even the Watt. ABC believes you, <laughs> Mr. President. Under Labor, home care packages sat at about 60,000 per annum. This year, 2018-19, they were 2018-19, they were 125,000. And by 2023, it will be 157,608. Over 160 per cent for the increase. answer has expired. Senator Ciccone, before I come to you, I'd like to acknowledge former Senator Stora in the gallery. Um, welcome back to the Senate. Senator Ciccone. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Um, my question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians. Minister. How many Australians have died whilst waiting for their home package in the last financial year? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. I don't have the latest figures. Uh, that order, uh, order, order on my left, Mr. President. I don't have the latest figures. I'm happy to take that number on notice. For the chamber, obviously, the figure for the last financial year, which is Senator quite public, is, is 16,000. Uh, Mr. President, this is a legitimate question. It's one of the reasons that the government takes this issue of aged care and the growth in home care packages so seriously. Uh, but, Mr. President, I don't have those figures at this point Order. in time, and I'm happy to take them on notice and come back to the chamber when they're available. No. Senator Ciccone, a supplementary question. Uh, Yesterday in question time, uh, when asked what advice he'd give a 95-year-old woman who has terminal illness and has been waiting on a waiting list for a level four package, and has been told that under this government that package would not be available for 22 months, and the minister responded by saying that that package is, is uh, much closer. My question to the minister is how much closer is that 95-year-old woman close to receiving the care that she desperately needs? Not much. Senator Colbeck. Well, Mr. Mr. President, uh, that process is determined independently of government by the national prioritisation process. Um, I don't have the capacity to Order. Uh, intervene in that process. It's a government set up. It's a Senator process Watt. set up by the government Senator deliberately Watt. to allow for the assessment of older Australians who require a, a, a home care package uh, to uh, allow for that process to determine whether they are a higher priority uh, in, in their need. Uh, and so, Mr President, uh, I have no capacity to make any determination in relation to that. The thing that we are looking to do, in line with the recommendations of the Royal Commission, is to add additional capacity into the system, and that's exactly what we did yesterday. We announced the extra 10,000 places, and we've acknowledged, Mr President, there's additional work to be done. There's additional work to be done. We are proud of our record, also, Mr. President. So we've, we've increased the number of home care packages from 60,000 when we came to government to 150,000 this year. Time for the answer has expired. On my left, order, order, Senator Polly, Senator Ciccone. Supple final supplementary question. 
with the average wait time for a level four package um, at over 22 months, what does the minister believe is a reasonable amount of time for a 95-year-old woman with a terminal illness? Senator Colbeck. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. And I've said publicly on a number of occasions I want older Australians, and the government says the same thing more broadly. We want older Australians to be able to get the care that they need as soon as possible. So uh, that's the process. Uh, Mr. President, and that's why we've continued to add. That's why we've continued to add additional capacity into the system. So last financial Order, year Senator we O'Neill. increased the capacity of the home care uh, sector by 25 per cent. This year we've put in an additional 15,000 packages. That's, we want Australians to be able to access the care that they need as soon as they possibly can. Uh, we, we won't do what Labor did with pink bats and. Uh, vet fee help, where they Order. created a circumstance for shonky providers to come into the market, undermining the safety of senior Australians. We're going to do this, as I've said a number of times, uh, with good policy, properly delivered, uh, and in a way that uh, provides the sort Order. of care that older Senator Australians Colbeck. need. Uh, Senator Wish Wilson. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. The Westpac CEO resigned this morning, and I think we can all agree in this chamber that the Westpac money laundering scandal is truly shocking. What is most shocking is that Austrac warned the banks about weakness in their IT systems as early as 2013, including that they were vulnerable to child exploitation by pedophiles. Minister, why wasn't the prospect that pedophiles were using the bank enough to curb Westpac's pursuit of profit? And why do you think in the Rev's resignation from Commonwealth Bank just two years ago on nearly identical grounds wasn't enough to put the fear of God into Westpac, its CEOs, their senior management, to make them change their act. Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr President. And, uh, Senator Rich Wilson, I've got to say uh, that is a very good question. Uh, and I think that that is a question that all of us uh, are entitled to ask. Uh, I mean, I've made that observation uh, on um, Radio National on Monday morning myself. I mean, given, <clears throat> given the events at the Commonwealth Bank uh, a few years ago, uh, surely every bank uh, would have, uh, you know, and every board and every um, managing director, CEO, uh, the leadership of every bank surely would have looked uh, very carefully at their operations uh, under their bonnet uh, to make absolutely certain that they weren't equally exposed. And the fact that they didn't. Uh, is an absolute disgrace, and, and that is, of course, now uh, why uh, the uh, that is, of course, now why Ostrak uh, will be uh, pursuing uh, Westpac as is appropriate, uh, you know, through the courts in the appropriate way. Uh, you know, Westpac will end up paying a very, very significant fine uh, for their failure to act, and I guess this is now also a warning to all of the other banks. I mean, like you know, we we, we expect that no other bank. Uh, is going to be so negligent as the Westpac uh, Bank has clearly been uh, in the wake of uh, this uh, latest round of revelations. Senator Wish Wilson, a supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. Um, Brian Hartzer told a meeting of executives yesterday that more than anything, the bank needed to get mortgages going and get the net promoter score going, even though they had just been found out to be enabling pedophiles. Sales remained Westpac's top priority. After $75 million Royal Commission and dozens of inquiries, I ask on behalf of most Australians, what is it going to take, Minister, to change the culture in Australian banks? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr uh, uh, President. And, uh, you know, in response to that question, well, the consequence uh, of uh, the revelations that Senator Rich Wilson is referencing uh, was pretty well immediate. Uh, I think you know, all, all senators would be aware uh, of the fact that the uh, CEO uh, of um, Westpac is stepping down, and I would, I would be very surprised if there weren't uh, further uh, decisions along those lines over the coming weeks. Uh, you know, clearly, clearly there was a, a complete failure uh, within Westpac to address uh, the issues that needed to be addressed, and I think uh, it will be a, a very, it will be a, this is a very clear uh, warning to uh, all other banks to ensure that they've got their affairs in order. Senator Wish Wilson, a final supplementary question. Yes, I, I have a, a question and a suggestion. Minister, after a raft of scandals in the banking system, Israel decided that the banks would not clean up their act 
until the incentive culture was eliminated and the Nesset legislated unanimously to cap executive pay in 2016. Minister, I ask on behalf of all Australians, I think we all agree there's been one scandal too many for the Australian people, will you now act to stop the rot and legislate to cap executive pay in Australia. Order. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. We will continue to implement the recommendations of the uh, Royal Commission into the banking sector, which of course build on a substantial uh, record of reform on the governments of both political persuasions over a number of years now. And you know, we will not stop uh, until all of the necessary reform has been uh, properly implemented. Senator Davey. Thank you. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Can the Minister outline to the Senate how the Morrison government's strong and stable economic management enables investment in groundbreaking medical research and clinical trials? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Davey for the question. Uh, Mr President, the benefits of a strong economy to health cannot be underestimated. The Morrison government recognises the importance of, in particular, clinical trials. What they do is drive new ideas and they achieve new discoveries, resulting in improved quality of life and survival rates, and they boost our nation's strong reputation as a global leader in medical research. It is estimated that more than 40,000 Australians are diagnosed with a rare or less common form of cancer. For many, there is a lack of evidence-based information to inform treatment options and support networks. While survival rates for high-incidence cancers have improved, those for rare cancers have remained relatively static. And that is why our landmark Medical Research Future Fund, we are investing $55 million to research rare cancers and diseases. This is the largest investment in clinical trials in any single round in Australian history. Mr President, the unprecedented clinical trials activity is aimed at developing new drugs, devices and treatments and ultimately saving lives. Of the $55 million investment that we're making, $15 million is for research into reproductive cancers, $5 million is for childhood brain cancer clinical trials with an aim to double the 10-year survival rate of childhood brain cancer, $20 million will address an increasingly significant burden of neurological disorder, and $15 million will address other significant gaps in current research and or knowledge in rare cancers, rare diseases and areas of unmet medical need. These are the benefits of a strong Order. economy. Senator, Cash. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Thank you. And can you provide some examples to the Senate of the clinical trials currently being undertaken by some of Australia's world-class medical researchers? Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. And you can't underestimate the impact of clinical trials. We're also investing as a government an additional $8 million in world-class clinical trials, focusing on conditions affecting heart, preterm baby lungs, the brain, infection control and dementia. There are five led Australian trials and they will receive funding from the Future Fund um, and the International Clinical Trials Collaborations Program. In relation to the five trials, the University of Western Australia will receive $1.8 million to investigate the best approach for treating severe narrowing of the aortic heart valve. Macquarie University will receive $3.1 million to investigate reducing the risks of dementia. The George Institute for Global Health will receive $902,000 to evaluate the best treatments for aneurysmal subarachnoid haemorrhage caused by burst artery into the brain. The University of Newcastle will receive some funding, as will Murdoch's Children's Research Institute. Senator Davey, a final supplementary question. Yes, finally, Minister, can you elaborate on the policy settings that have made this landmark investment possible? Senator Cash. Well, again, Mr. President. Our government, the Morrison government, is able to make and provide an unprecedented level of support to health and medical research because of the plan we've put in place to enable a strong economy. We've put in place the right economic framework to ensure that the economy grows so that we can invest in the services 
that the Australian people deserve. And on this side of the chamber, we understand that in order to sustainably fund the health services Australians deserve, you need to run a strong economy. This allows us, of course, to invest in record funding for medicine, the care and the research for all Australians. Our record is reflected in our results. Record listings on the pharmaceutical benefit scheme, record investments in medical research, record bulk billing and record funding our hospitals. This would not be possible without the coalition's strong economic management. Senator Watt. Mr President, my question is to the Minister for Resources and Northern Australia, Senator Canavan. After four years of operation and four reviews, the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility has released only $44 million, less than 1 per cent of its $5 billion budget. When asked on notice how many jobs had been created by the NAIF, all the minister could talk about were jobs that might be created at some point in the future. Minister, how many jobs have actually been created in the four years the NAIF has been in operation? Minister for Northern Australia, Senator Canavan. Well, thank you, Mr. President. I thank uh, Senator Watt for his question. Uh, Mr. President, the Northern Australian Infrastructure Facility has made a very good progress over the last year. It has now funded over $1.5 billion, or just under $1.5 billion. Dollars of investments. Now, I was the first to admit it got off to a slow start, Mr. President. It got off to a slow start because we were doing something innovative, something different, uh, and it took a little Senator while Watt. to get going. But 15 months ago, I think about 16 months ago now, we made some changes to the investment mandate that have unlocked one and a half billion dollars of investments across Northern Senator Australia. Watt. That is going to create, Mr. President, 2,400 2, jobs. Around Northern Senator Australia. Canavan, please uh, resume your seat. Yeah, Sen Senator Canavan, please resume your seat. Senator Watt, you've asked a question. I've called you to order it quite a few times this week. I, I will ask you to take a deep breath and not continue to interject for a little while after I call you to order at least. You've asked a question. I'd like to hear the answer. Senator Canavan. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Now, Mr. President, <laughs> the approach that Senator Watt is suggesting is that somehow we should send the money out from day one of a project. This is why, Mr President, the Labor Party don't know how to manage money. So, as I've said, over the past order. 12 Senator, months— Senator, oh, Senator, Senator, Canada, like Senator Watt, on a point of order. Uh, I'm, I'm on, on relevance. I'm mindful of your previous rulings, but he hasn't gone near the question, which is how many jobs have actually been created, not how many will be one day, maybe, sometime in the future. How many have actually been created? That's the question. Um, that was— on the point of order, that was the conclusion of your question, Senator Watt. I believe the minister was being directly relevant to the preamble you outlined, which was the reason for expenditure being of a certain pattern. That said, I will remind the minister not to impute motives to the asker of the question in answering it, because that would not be directly relevant. Senator Canavan. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Well, a hypothetical senator who was making a point <laughs> saying that we should somehow we should somehow send all the money out on day one is the reason why the Australian people don't trust the Labor Party with money. Because what happens, of course, what happens, of course, is that money is provided to projects as milestones are met. So when you're building a house, Mr. President, when the slab goes down, the builder gets a bit of money. When the frame goes up, he gets a bit more. When the roof goes on, he gets a little more. And that is what are going to happen. That's what's going to happen with this one and a half billion dollars we're investing in Northern left. Australia to get economic activity going. Now, that is actually going to create 4,000 jobs in total. I, I was underestimating it before, but 4,000 jobs over the next few years because we, we are taking the decisions, Mr. President, to develop our nation. Uh, to invest in parts of our country that aren't as developed as the rest of the country, but have huge opportunity, and that's why I'm very, very uh, happy to see the progress that we've made over the last year. But more importantly, the jobs that will be created in the years to come from these investments in remote parts of our country. Order on my left, Senator Watt, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. The largest loan approved by the NAIF, nearly half the value of total loans committed by the NAIF is a $610 million loan for a pumped hydro project in North Queensland, a project Federal Labor supports. The loan has now been delayed Order. after reports emerged that it may lapse. Can the minister advise the Senate, is this $610 million loan proceeding, yes or no? Senator Canavan. Thank you, Mr President. Well, Mr. President the, um the offer or the investment decision of the Northern Australian Infrastructure Facility to invest in the GenX project remains on the table. 
Indeed, the Northern Australian Infrastructure Facility announced a couple of weeks ago that they would extend the, the, that decision or extend the validity of that decision through to next year uh, for another six months. The reason for the delays of that project are uh, unrelated to the Northern Australian Infrastructure Facility. They relate to the proponent themselves and getting other uh, off-take agreements in place with customers. Obviously, these things happen from time to time, but we are committed, Mr President, to the future of Northern Australia. We are committed uh, to staying the course here on all of these uh, projects, and I think that project in particular uh, is very important to secure the power supplies of northern Queensland, and that's why we'll keep working with proponents to finalise that decision, and I'm hopeful uh, that that will be made very soon. Senator Watt, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. This $610 million loan is now the second loan approved by the NAIF that is under a cloud, following news that a $19.5 million loan to Pilbara Minerals Limited has also fallen over. Minister, how many other NAIF loans are at risk of falling over? Senator Kennedy. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Well, again, Mr. President, that, that particular investment that the senator refers to, uh, related to changes in lithium markets outside the government's control, that's unfortunate. But we'll keep working. Now, there are other uh, there are other NAIF investments, Mr. President, that have been held up. For example, the NAIF was considering considering building a rail line to the Galilee Basin, Mr. President, that could have created thousands of jobs in central Queensland. But because the Labor Party doesn't support the coal industry, Mr. President, they Order, blocked sorry. that loan. Order, the Senator Canavan, please. Loan. Order, Senator Canavan, please resume your seat. Cut. My apologies. I was being advised by a member of your team, Senator Watt. I didn't see you stand, Senator Watt, on a point Thank of you. order. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Yeah. I know the minister isn't enjoying being exposed, uh, but the question Order. was about one project. Order the on minister was, right. a, was if you, the question if on relevance. Direct relevance. On relevance, relevance bait, direct, uh, relevance yes, direct relevance. Watt. Direct relevance. The question was about one project where the NAIF loan has fallen over. The minister wants to talk about another project. Can you come back to the actual question that was asked? Okay. Um, on the point of order, Senator Watt, um, I'll be honest, I was being advised by a member of order. I was being advised. Senator Watt, I'm ruling on your point of order if you could take a breath. Um, I was being advised about the order of subsequent questions, so I did lose track for 10 seconds of the minister's answer. You've reminded him of it. I'll take this opportunity to remind him of you doing so. Senator Canavan. Well, thank you, Mr President. Well, we, we, Senator Watt did in his question, Mr President, refer to other projects, and there were yeah. other NAIF projects that could have been going by now if only the Labor Party would black jobs in regional areas. But we know, Mr President, that the Labor Party have long since deserted Order. the mining industry, Mr President. Now, in Northern Australia, in Northern Australia, half of the economy is in mining. But those guys over there don't support the industry, and if you don't support the mining industry, you don't support the development of Northern Australia. That's what we support, Mr. President, and we'll keep backing those industries to create jobs Order, in Northern Senator Australia. Canada. And Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Can the minister advise the Senate what the Morrison government is doing to tackle the unemployment of young Australians who are suffering with a mental illness? The Minister for Social Services and Families, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And can I thank Senator Chandler for her question about a matter that is very important and facing a lot of young Australians, and that is those who are suffering with mental illness. The government is absolutely focused on removing barriers to employment. And one of those is by investigating new and innovative ways that we can improve outcomes for those people who are unemployed. And we know that the onset of mental illness, often when it occurs in adult, uh, adolescents and young adults, can be a significant barrier for young people being able to get into the workforce, and it leads to some very poor employment outcomes for those, those people. And we know how important it is to help young people to overcome those barriers to work because giving people, getting people into work gives them a sense of identity and purpose and provides them with a sense of direction and achievement. And this is especially true for young Australians. One of the programs that we are currently working on uh, is the Individual Placement and Support Trial. And it's a tailored approach that co-locates uh, employment services and employment incentives at the same place as where uh, people are able to receive uh, help for mental health services. And that's through the work uh, of Headspace. The original IPS model was actually developed for adults, 
But in 2015, the decision was made to trial it with young people to see whether young people under the age of 25 could benefit from a similar type of wraparound service. So we originally set up uh, 14 player sites in co-location with Headspace, and this year we've added more funding to extend the amount of trials out to 24 sites across the country. But what makes this model so different and has been so successful is the fact that it actually embeds the employment specialist alongside the healthcare worker to make sure that the young people are getting the wraparound services that they need to ensure that they have successful employment outcomes into the future. Senator Chandler, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Minister, how does the individual placement and support model compare against other programs in generating employment outcomes? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much. Um, particularly, um, this particular program is showing early signs of being particularly successful when it comes to um, allowing young people to transition uh, into work and to deal with the barriers of mental health that they find themselves facing in the process of moving into work. Um, as I said, this particular trial co-locates both the employment services and support that the individual needs alongside of the mental health supports that young people need, sometimes to deal with issues of anxiety, depression and other mental health conditions. But most particularly, these trial sites have been focused around areas where we have seen higher levels of unemployment and also lower socio-economic disadvantage. But importantly, New Start recipients who have entered the program had the highest level of employment success, with over 60 per cent of those that were on New Start moving into a job since being engaged in the program. And equally important, one in three of the young people on a disability support pension also Order. got a job. Senator, Rustin. Senator Chandler, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, given the benefits of the program that you've just outlined, why is a strong economy important to tackling unemployment of young people suffering with a mental illness? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much. Um, and mental health and suicide prevention is absolutely the core focus of the health priority of this government, and it's absolutely central to the Commonwealth's long-term national health plan. And it is a strong economy that allows us to invest in these targeted health initiatives to help young people, to equip young people with the skills and the resources that they need to, to deal with the barriers that they face when they're going into work, to deal with their mental uh, health conditions, to make sure that they either enter into education or enter into employment. And I think we are very, very proud of the fact that we can say that we're doing far more than any previous government to safeguard the health of Australians, and particularly young Australians, with an expected $5.3 billion invested in uh, the mental health of Australians this year alone, because we understand that overcoming barriers to work is one of the core roles that government has to ensure all Australians have the opportunity to get a job. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Minister Cash. Last week, the government resettled a Rwandan uh, refugee who was accused of murdering eight Western tourists during a rampage in Uganda in 1999. Two others accused of the same crimes were resettled in Australia last year. The three of them were brought here under the refugee swap that the coalition negotiated with the United States. What kind of deal is this? The US clearly didn't want them in their community. They held the men for more than a decade in immigration detention. Do these men pose a security risk to the Australian community, and has the Australian community been told? The Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Lambie for the question in relation to uh, the details of those that Senator Lambie has referred to. Uh, we would normally not comment on individual cases, but what I will do, uh, because I don't have a brief on that, Order. is take that on notice for you. Order. Uh, Mr President, I said that I will take it Order. on notice. Senator Cash, please resume your seat. I can't hear the minister. If I can't hear her, then others will not be able to. Senator Cash. What I can advise you, though, Senator Lambie, is that the Prime Minister confirmed publicly in May of this year that Australia had resettled two Rwandans from the United States in 2018. He also stated these people were resettled as refugees, along with other Rwandans and people from a range of other countries, 
under Australia's ongoing humanitarian program. He also said, as the Prime Minister noted, both individuals were subject to strict security and character checks. Senator Lambie, a supplementary question. And did the Prime Minister bother to tell Australians out there that the former US judge Wayne Isker rejected the asylum claim of two of these Rwandan men in 2007 because he believed they were, and I quote, a danger to the community? He further noted that these men were members of a terrorist group. He did not find that they had been rehabilitated. If these men try to come under Section 501 of the Immigration Act, they'd be rejected on character grounds. How about that? They will be considered a threat. Why didn't Order. the minister Senator refuse Lambie, these people time for a visa? The question has expired. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you. And again, Mr. President, uh, we would not normally comment on individual cases. I will go back to the comments that the Prime Minister made at the time. Both individuals were subject to strict security and character checks. I can also advise that the Rwandans were not part of the United States resettlement arrangement. Senator Lambie, final supplementary question. Well, I'm not sure um, how Homeland uh, how Security finds this, but many of us find it um, absolutely absurd that this is going on in our own Senator country. Senator Lambie, question Australia time. Australians deserve to know if the deal is putting their safety at risk. They deserve to know what exactly the government has agreed to do here, because at the moment it looks as though we're giving the US our genuine refugees and getting criminals, and more criminals at that, in return. How many more members of a terrorist organisation do you plan to bring to Australia under the deal that none of us are allowed to see? Senator Cash. Uh, well, thank you, Mr President. And, uh, I'm going to have to reject the premise of Senator Lambie's question outright. Uh, in response to Senator Lambie's uh, first supplementary question, I did advise the Rwandans were not part of the United States resettlement arrangement, which really does make then all other statements that Senator Lambie has made um, redundant. Have you concluded your answer, Senator Cash? Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Shortly before question time, it was revealed that detectives from the New South Wales Police Crime Command's Financial Crime Squad have launched a special task force, Strike Fort Garrard, to investigate the behaviour of Minister Angus Taylor and to determine if he committed any criminal offences in relation to the altered document he used to attack the city of Sydney. When did the Prime Minister first become aware of this investigation, and what actions has the, has the Prime Minister taken since becoming aware to ensure the integrity of his government? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. President. Firstly, I'm not aware when the Prime Minister first became aware, so I'll take that question uh, on notice. And uh, in relation to the second part of the question, I believe that the Prime Minister has answered uh, a question in relation to this in the House of Representatives. Uh, where he has uh, indicated that he will uh, seek uh, to obtain relevant information from New South Wales Police. Senator Wong, supplementary question. Can the Minister advise whether or not Minister Taylor has been interviewed by the New South Wales Police as part of Strike Forward Force Garrard's investigation into his behaviour? And will the Prime Minister ensure that the Minister undertakes to cooperate fully with the police investigation? Senator Cormann. Uh, th th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, well, f firstly, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm not aware in relation to the uh, question in the first part of the question. In relation to the second part of the question, of course, of, of course, uh, you know, all, all ministers will always, uh, uh, always cooperate with uh, relevant uh, inquiries as appropriate. Senator Wong, final supplementary question. The Prime Minister's own statement. I think Senator Cash wishes to say order. something. She obviously has some expertise on this order. topic. Senator, order on my right and left. Senator Wong is on her feet. Order. Senators Watt and Cash. Senators Watt and Cash, please. Senator Wong. The Prime Minister's own statement of ministerial standards makes it the personal responsibility of the Prime Minister to decide whether or not to stand aside a minister. Given the criminal investigation launched by the New South Wales Police, when will Minister Taylor be stood down? Does the Prime Minister retain his confidence in Minister Taylor? 
Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, let me just uh, say right up front, Mr. Taylor is an outstanding minister, and the reason the Labour Party attacks him is because he's very effective in bringing down the price of electricity, as well as bringing down, as well as, as well as bringing down emissions Order. in a way that is economically responsible. The second point I would make is that I will never take the words of the Labour Party to describe what is actually happening. Uh, what the Prime Minister has indicated uh, appropriately to the House of Representatives is that he will make uh, the appropriate inquiries uh, and, uh, of course, uh, make the appropriate judgments if and as required. Senator McMahon. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Resources and Northern Australia, Senator Canavan. Can the minister please outline how the Liberal National Government is providing stability and certainty to Northern Australia by investing in better roads and infrastructure? Minister for Resources in Northern Australia, Senator Canavan. Thank you very much, Mr President. Mr President, the greatest thing about the government's commitment to build and develop Northern Australia is the benefits it's providing uh, to the people of Northern Australia, particularly through better infrastructure, Mr President. So, Mr President, across Northern Australia over the last few years, uh, we have invested and, and are building 37 different road projects dedicated uh, to improving access and productivity for our beef sector, the first beef roads program for decades, uh, for investing in infrastructure that supports our agriculture, mining and tourism sector. And altogether now, this project has helped, or this, these roads have helped to seal 480 kilometres of roads, Mr. President. So that's enough to drive from here all the way to Newcastle. So those who are driving back to Sydney after this week, we've, we've sealed all that road, type of road across northern Australia and further on the way to Newcastle as well. 17 of those projects are completed. 17 are underway as we speak, creating jobs at the moment, and three will be completed by the end of next year. Altogether, Mr. President, altogether those 37 projects are creating 2,400. 400 jobs across northern Australia, and I'm particularly proud of the jobs they're providing for Indigenous communities in particular. Every road has to have an Indigenous employment uh, participation target, uh, and some roads have over half of their, their, their uh, construction workforce from Indigenous communities. Now, Mr. President, there's roads like the Han Highway, which will create the first sealed route from, from Cairns down to Melbourne inland. The first sealed route from Cairns to Melbourne inland. It will save eight hours off the journey. It will help our particularly horticulture growers get their product to market faster. As Alison Murphy says uh, from up in North Queensland, the trucks will do a lot better times because it's 800 kilometres shorter uh, to get from Townsville to Melbourne along this route that we are building. We're also building building the Tom Price to Karratha Corridor, which is going to open up mining opportunities uh, in Western Australia, and also the, the Alice Springs to Halls Creek, the Tanami Road, which has been spoken about for decades. We are sealing the Tanami Road, which will particularly help Indigenous communities and gold mines out there. Order, more for Senator, Australia and for Northern... uh, Senator McMahon, a supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister outline any recent investments from North Australia Infrastructure Facility and tell us again how many jobs these investments are supporting? Senator Canavan. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, uh, um, as I was mentioning earlier in question time, those, Senator those, 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 those voices of negativity have gone from saying, oh, they're not investing enough projects to they're not spending enough. Senator well, Watt. Mr. President, we have invested now, or made decisions investing in 15 projects supporting 4,000 jobs across northern Australia. I'm very proud of some of these projects, Mr. Uh, Mr. President, which wouldn't have happened without the northern right. development agenda of this government. Right. So, for example, one project. First Iron Ore will be the first Indigenous-owned iron ore mine in this country. First Indigenous-owned iron ore mine in this country, backed by this government, supported by this government. It's going to create 120 jobs in construction and 120 jobs in the operations mine, helping helping Indigenous rural communities get a, get a head start. We're all supported, supporting an abattoir in central Queensland to give access, better access for cattle producers to more meat works to get a better price for their product. I don't have enough time to go on, Mr President, but there's so much we're doing in the north and it's so exciting to be there at the moment. Order. Senator Watt, take a breath when I call your name for at least 20 seconds before subsequent disorderly interjections. I think I called him halfway through that question. Senator McMahon. Can the minister outline the investments the government is making in Northern Australia to harness its abundant water resources and how that is increasing agricultural developments in Australia? Senator Canavan. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, obviously, Senator Watt just does not like hearing about progress, doesn't he? He hates it. He, he, he wants to interject and stop progress. That's what the Labor Party are good at, Mr. President. But we on this side love progress. We love jobs being created. We love our country being developed. 
and we're also developing the water resources of Northern Australia, uh, investing $700 million across water projects in Northern Australia. These projects are across the north, uh, particularly ones like Rookwood Weir, which is underway at the moment. That's going to, be, that's going to help double agricultural production in the Fitzroy Basin. We're investing $200 million to guarantee the water security for Townsville and their, and their future, and also uh, getting started on the Hells Gate Dam. Uh, it will be a, one of the biggest dams in Queensland once it's built. That's starting under this project. And really, the benefits of this, Mr. President, for the people in these regions. So, for example, Simone Laurie from um, the Artesian Gluten Free Bakery in Rocky says she currently employs 11 staff, but will have more staff once Rookwood Weir is under construction. That's what we're doing, Order. creating jobs Senator and supporting Kennedy, businesses in the time north. Time for the answer has expired. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Attorney General. Minister, can you confirm that a person known to the courts as Alan Johns, who is also known as Witness J, was secretly imprisoned in the ACT? Under what law was the person known to the courts as Alan Johns charged? With what offence was he charged and in what jurisdiction? Did the Attorney General or any former Attorney General sign off on or endorse this prosecution? Minister representing the Attorney General, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I will take that question on notice and uh, provide advice to the Chamber. Senator McKim, supplementary question. Well, you can take these on notice too, Minister. When were the charges laid? How did the person known as Alan Johns plead to the charges? What sentence was imposed on the person known to the courts as Alan Johns? If the court was closed, was it closed on the basis of an application by the Commonwealth? How many other people have been charged, tried or imprisoned secretly in Australia in the last 10 years? Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr President. I'll take that question on notice. Senator McKim, a final supplementary question. Thank you, President. Minister, do you accept that open justice is a fundamental plank of the rule of law? How can a secret charge, trial and conviction happen in a liberal democracy like Australia? What possible circumstances could justify this extreme level of secrecy? Senator Payne. Mr President, given I've taken Senator McKim's preceding questions on notice, I'll take that on notice and respond accordingly. Senator Sheldon. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Payne. In a speech to the Business Council of Australia, Prime Minister Morrison announced that his government is undertaking a comprehensive and methodical fresh look at the operation of our industrial relations system. Will the minister rule out any watering down of unfair dismissal laws? The minister representing the Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. I thank Senator Sheldon for his question. As both the uh, Attorney General, who is also of course, the Minister for Industrial Relations, and the Prime Minister have said, there are a number of areas in which the Attorney General is, uh, is reviewing uh, the current uh, legislative and other arrangements as they pertain to industrial and workplace issues in Australia. Uh, the uh, discussion papers which the minister has issued are part of that process. Uh, I believe and understand that uh, input is encouraged to that process, and I look forward to seeing the outcomes. I don't have any further detail to provide, Senator Sheldon, but I'm happy to take anything further on notice. Senator Sheldon, a supplementary question. Uh, will the minister rule out any weakening of the better of overall test? Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr. President. The details of the uh, discussion papers are uh, part of the Minister for Industrial Relations process. Uh, they go to the issues in the broad that uh, the minister is uh, reviewing. Uh, if there is further information I can provide to the Senate, I will on notice, Mr. President. Senator Sheldon, the final supplementary question. Government members are calling for the watering down of unfair dismissal laws, weakening of the better off overall test, and the ripping up of mod the modern award system. Why is the Morrison government so committed to undermining protections for working Australians and attacking the unions who represent them? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And uh, I think the uh, premise of, uh, of the senator's question is completely misplaced. Yeah, yeah. What this government is interested in doing is ensuring that the legislative arrangements are fit for purpose, that we enable workers to be protected, we enable business to get on with doing their jobs, and that, frankly, Mr. President, that is employing Australians. Senator Rennick. Um, my question. Order. 
Order. Senator Reddick. <laughs> My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Birmingham. How is the government working with the states to capture new energy opportunities for the 21st century? Yeah. Order. On my left, I've had, I struggled to hear the, the, the person's question, but if the minister heard it, I will call him and allow him to answer. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Mr. President. I thank Senator Rennick for, uh, for his question and uh, his strong interest, I know, in relation to a range of policy areas, but particularly in relation to energy policy. And, uh, I'm very pleased, Mr. President, to be able to inform Senator Rennick and, uh, and the Senate uh, that our government has finalised the, uh, the National Hydrogen Strategy as part of our commitment and drive to deliver affordable and reliable electricity for the Australian people and energy resources, not just in Australia, but indeed to drive the energy needs of our region and the world, as Australia has done so effectively for so long. The National Hydrogen Strategy will set Australia on a path to become a major player in the global hydrogen industry by 2030. It's estimated uh, this work undertaken by the chief scientist, Dr Alan Finkel, uh, that the Australian hydrogen industry could generate around 7,600 jobs. Jobs, Mr President, jobs. Those opposite aren't ever terribly interested in jobs. They don't like hearing about our government's record on jobs. They don't like acknowledging the one and a half million jobs our government's played a role in helping to create the environment to sustain. And of course, in relation to the hydrogen strategy, it's about supporting ongoing jobs, especially, Mr President, in regional Australia. Jobs that will be part of what could be an $11 billion per annum industry and contribution to our GDP by 2050. The national strategy is the culmination of work between the federal government and all states and territories. Uh, and it's been driven very much by the reality that uh, investors, innovators, others and our regional partners, particularly in nations such as Japan, Korea, Singapore, are all interested in the opportunities of the hydrogen industry, are eager to cooperate uh, with Australia, and that's why the Morrison government announced substantial uh, implementation plans around the hydrogen strategy, $370 million to back new hydrogen Order, projects. Senator Birmingham, time for the answers expired. Senator Rennick, a supplementary question. Can the minister explain how these policies will contribute towards a stronger economy by capturing trade and investment opportunities and creating jobs, particularly in our regional areas. Senator Birmingham. Well, both the International Energy Agency and the World Energy Council identify Australia as a potential hydrogen production powerhouse. As a potential production powerhouse. It's good news, Mr. President. That's why they're interjecting opposite, of course. They only interject either when there's good news from the government or when they're standing up for their union mates. And I suspect we might be hearing quite a bit of irrational noise from them over the hours to come in this place. Uh, but, Mr. President, Mr. President, in relation to hydrogen, the chief scientist describes Australia's potential there as about shipping sunshine, the possibility for us to be able order. to generate. Order, Senator Cormann, on a point of order. I'm reluctant to rise on a point of order, but uh, interjections are disorderly, and there's been there's been a barrage of interjections uh, against uh, Senator Birmingham, who is providing very important Thank information you, to order. the Senate and to the Australian people. So I would ask on you to call. Uh, quite the right. I, I have called. I have called senators to order on a number of occasions. A handful, in particular, on my left. I will ask senators to restrain themselves for the last minute and a bit of question time. Senator Birmingham to continue. Thanks, Mr. President. The opportunities for the hydrogen industry exist across many states. They exist across Senator Rennick's great state of Queensland. They exist across my great state of South Australia. Indeed, there, the Hydrogen Regulatory Working Group is currently supporting three megawatt scale projects in which the South Australian government has co invested over $40 million alongside the type of investments our government Order, is Senator now Birmingham. scaling up. Senator Rennick, a final supplementary question. Will these policies also help to reduce power prices into the future? Senator Birmingham. Order. Well, Mr President, these policies have the benefit of helping to drive a new export industry for Australia in terms of using our renewable energy capabilities in particular uh, to to develop hydrogen and to be able to send it, as we have so successfully in terms of other energy sources, out into our region. But it also has the potential to help with Australia's energy grid into the future and meeting our energy needs, and sits alongside 
the work that our government has done in terms of implementing the new retailer reliability obligation, the new grid reliability fund being established, putting in place price caps in the national electricity market, uh, delivering in terms of the passage of the new big stick laws. All of these types of measures have seen stabilisation of energy prices, indeed a fall in wholesale electricity prices. The last quarter in Senator Rennick's state of Queensland, in my state of South Australia, had the lowest prices since 2016. That's because the government's reforms are working and through the hydrogen strategy we're investing for the long Order. term. Senator Birmingham. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, Mr President, I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper and I seek I leave. I seek leave to move uh, a motion to provide for the consideration of the Fair Work Registered yes, Organisations Amendment Housing Integrity Bill 2019. Uh, uh, Leader of the Government has precedence. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is not granted. Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, pursuant to contingent notice uh, standing in my name, I move that so much of the standing orders be suspended as would prevent me moving a motion to provide for the consideration of a matter, namely a motion to provide that a motion relating to the consideration of the Fair Work Registered Organisations Amendment ensuring integrity bill 2009 may be, may be moved immediately and determined without amendment or debate. Senator Wall. On, in relation to the suspension of standing orders that the government, leader of the government has moved, let's be clear what we're voting on right now. The government is moving this motion so it can ram through its extreme anti-worker legislation. That's what's happening. This bill doesn't apply to business. It doesn't apply to the banks. It doesn't apply to Angus Taylor. It Order. doesn't apply to Senator, Corm Senator Cash. It only applies to working people and their representatives. It is an all-out assault, an all-out assault on workers' ability to organise, run their own union and determine who leads them. It is an attack on nurses, midwives, teachers, police officers and their representatives. You know, this bill has been called, it was called the Ensuring Integrity Bill. Yeah, you know what it is? It's just like work choices. And I was here for the work choices legislation, and you lot haven't changed. You lot haven't Order. changed since then. You're, you, can't, you don't care less about integrity. You, you want to hide information from the people of Australia. You're a government that is loose with the truth. And I tell you what, oh boy, are you a government that doesn't like scrutiny. I mean, we've seen Angus Taylor. What has he blocked? blocked FOI access to 200 documents and refused to answer questions. And if you are serious about integrity, we might have some legislation for a National Integrity Commission. Exactly. But no, we've got a motion on this bill. And what about the Banking Royal Commission? Last year, big banks made billions of dollars from ordinary Australians by routinely breaching the law, but you're not here today to crack down on lawlessness in the banks. You're not here to implement the, the recommendations of the Royal Commission. In fact, after 299 days, you've implemented six out of 76 recommendations of the Royal Commission you were dragged kicking and screaming to support. In fact, this government, this government which talks about integrity, is trying to ram through anti-worker legislation in a week when it was revealed that Westpac breached Australian money laundering laws 23 million times. 23 million and failed to act on customers using its service to purchase child exploitation materials. But is this your priority? No, you know what the Prime Minister says? He says that lawlessness, 23 million breaches of the law and abetting child abusers, that's a matter for the board. But you want to use this chamber and the Parliament of Australia to expedite a bill that could deregister de unions representing midwives, flight attendants and firefighters for three paperwork breaches. Three paperwork breaches. You know, you lot haven't changed since we debated work choices in here. It's the same anti-worker ideology. The same anti-worker ideology, the same attack on working conditions. Confirmed Order. today when Senator on Payne right refused to rule out a watering down of unfair dismissal laws, refused to rule out a watering down of the better off overall test. I mean that clearly demonstrates should demonstrate to everybody what this bill 
that is being rammed through as a consequence of this motion is all about. It is all about trying to take out the union movement so you can go after working people and their conditions. And out of the mouth of the Prime Minister and Minister Payne, we saw that today. Let this government, let's not forget that this government is trying to ram through anti-worker legislation in a week where it's revealed that one in five workers, one in five workers in construction, health care, retail accommodation and food services industries have been a victim of wage theft. But are you going to do something about that? But the $1.35 billion in workers' wages underpaid each year? No. You want to attack the organisations that help people get this money back. They're your priorities. It says everything about this government, everything about the Liberal Party, that the passage of this anti-worker bill is your number one priority. This is a government with no plans and no principles. The only thing they are united on, the only thing they are capable of, is a relentless political attack on working people and their representatives. And this has been the way this coalition, this Liberal Party, has operated for decades and is the same ideology and the same agenda as work choices. The motion and this bill are about whether you think that there should be one standard for workers and their representatives and another standard for everyone else. This government, Mr President, they do not care about integrity. This government does not care about lawlessness, and it does not care about workers. We will be opposing this motion Order. and the bill. Senator Wong, time for the contribution has expired. Senator Payne. So, Mr President, uh, it's clear to those here that on the other side they absolutely know they can't defend the indefensible. They can't defend the indefensible. This is sensible, balanced legislation. So what they're trying to do is to seek to silence debate in this chamber, Mr. President, while they actually tell, and Senator Wong did it again, egregious untruths about the content of this legislation, Mr. President. This motion that Senator Cormann has moved is about time is about hours for debate, as I understand it, Mr President, but those opposite don't even want to have the debate because they want to protect their protectors. That's quite clear, Mr President. They know, we know, that the existing laws are inadequate, that they've led to a widespread culture of misconduct in registered organisations, and it's about registered organisations, Mr President, not that you would have known that from Senator Wong's speech. So the changes that we are looking at around disqualification, about deregistration, about amalgamations, the issues that Senator Wong has, ra has raised are changes which are needed now. And it's because there's a pattern of behaviour, Mr President, a pattern of behaviour that leads those opposite to protect the people that send them here. That is absolutely transparent, absolutely transparent from what Senator Wong had to say here today. We know that of all of the examples that she put forward, all of the examples that the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate put forward, Mr. President, nothing proves their case because we know they can't, as I said, defend the indefensible. Do you know, Mr. President, since this, month, since this uh, bill has been before the Senate, we have one union in Australia, one union and seven of its officers who have been penalised by the courts for more than 30 contraventions of the law. But they're not even prepared to have a discussion about it. They're not even prepared to have the debate in this chamber because this is only about, Mr President, this is only about them protecting, as I said, their protectors. And the breaches that Senator Farrell refers to will be dealt with by Austrac in the courts. What are you afraid of, Senator Farrell? Dealt with by Austrac in the courts. Dealt with by the changes we have brought in in relation to banking in this country since the Royal Commission. The changes which we have made, which ensure that that sort of behaviour is addressed. But you will not. You won't even allow a debate here today about uh, about this practice. We, we saw, Mr. President, and we have seen those opposite afraid of integrity. That's what they're afraid of. So a bill that ensures integrity in registered organisations is not something they are even prepared to, to contemplate. And that's why we should be bringing it forward, Mr President, to have this discussion. It's about ensuring that registered organisations behave in an appropriate way, that their misconduct can be addressed, because their members deserve that. Their members deserve that, but there is no interest on the other side in ensuring that members are properly looked after by registered organisations. 
absolutely no interest whatsoever. There is a, what is it, a no problem here approach from those opposite? Nothing to see? Well, the courts, the record shows differently. We have seen it through the Trade Union Royal Commission. We have seen it with behaviours in this chamber, and they would prefer to do absolutely nothing. Well, this government won't do nothing. This government recognises that registered organisations have a responsibility to their members, a responsibility to those they represent, and we have a responsibility, Mr. President, to ensure that the legislative construct around that protects the organisations and their workers. So, Mr. President, it's been called extreme legislation. Extreme legislation. But it is not extreme legislation because these are very important organisations. Members place a great deal of trust in them, and they should be protected adequately. There is no place in the system for those who breach the trust of their members. There is no place in the system for those who act in their own interests at the expense of members or those who show nothing but contempt for the laws that apply equally to all Australians. So we seek to have a debate on this legislation today, Mr. President. This debate is about ours, not about the bill itself, although Senator Wong did not appear to turn herself to that matter. We seek to have that debate, but those opposite are trying to avoid it because they know they can't defend the indefensible. They know they want to try and silence debate in this chamber while they tell terrible mistruths about this legislation, Mr. President, inside the chamber and outside the chamber. And frankly, the debate will only expose them. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, if this government was really serious about integrity, why are they running a protection racket for one of their own ministers, Angus Taylor, under investigation, under investigation from, under, under, under investigation? I know what I've read in the uh, in the newspapers. I know what I've read in the newspapers. Um, Order. Order. Interjections across the table are disorderly. I remind people of the motion we're discussing. Thank you. And to, and, and, and to Dis Senator Farrell to continue. Thank you for that protection, uh, um, Mr. President. Um, if this government was serious about integrity, then you'd be doing something about the integrity of one of your own ministers. But, but instead, instead. Instead, you're picking on the workers and their organisations. Now, when John Howard, when John Howard lost the 2007 election, uh, Mr. President, Tony Abbott said that work choices was dead, buried, and cremated. But, but it's not. It's not, Mr. President. It's roared back. It's roared back into this parliament, and it's roared back in the form of this misnamed integrity bill. Uh, and it's come back in two parts. It's come back in two parts, Mr. President. Part number one, part number one, Senator Payne. Part number one is this bill we're going to be debating this afternoon. Um, what does that bill do? It ties unions up in knots in terms of um, uh, turns them up in, uh, turns them uh, ties them up in knots, uh, filling out paperwork and not letting them do the work that they need to do in this uh, in this country which is boost wages and conditions. That's step number one. That's part number one of this legislation. Tie them up. And then there's part number two. Part number two is coming. Part number two is on its way, having weakened the union by passing this, uh, passing this uh, legislation. What do they do next? Well, they come after the workers. They come after their, worker, uh, their uh, entitlements. Now, um, I have to say that this— so, Prime Minister Morrison has, in fact, been smarter than uh, Prime Minister Howard. I've got to admit that. He's far more cunning. Rather than, going, rather than going after the workers directly, he's going after the unions first, and then he goes after the workers. Now, what are the problems that we've got in this country at the moment? Ensuring integrity? No. What, what's happening in this country at the moment? We've got a series of serious economic problems. Wages have stagnated. Wages have stagnated in this. Wages have stagnated in this country, Senator. They've stagnated, and they continue to stagnate. Unemployment is rising, particularly in my own state, Senator, uh, uh, Mr. President. Uh, their unemployment is rising. Retail sales are either flatlining or falling. They're serious problems. They're serious problems that ordinary Australians are facing. Uh, what is this government doing about it? Well, 
It's attacking the one set of uh, organisations that might be able to turn this situation round. Mm -hmm. It's attacking the unions and limiting their ability uh, to uh, do the job that uh, they, uh, they need to be doing, which is wage, raising the wages and conditions. This government, this government should be supporting unions. Exactly. This government should be supporting unions to do the job that they need to do uh, to get real wage rises going in this country and to kick-start the economy. Absolutely. Instead, we've got work choices mark two, uh, tying up tying up unions in unbelievable amounts of paperwork, uh, stopping their vital work in lifting wages, and. What about the comparison? This is supposed to be the same set of laws uh, applying to unions as applying to, to companies. Uh, <coughs> Senator Payne referred to a particular union that had seven, uh, seven uh, <coughs> offences against it. What did we see this week? Um, bank, 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 officials, bank officials having broken the law 23 million times. Now, of course, the, the person. The, I agree with you, there, uh, Senator Lyons. That is a disgrace. But what did the person who committed those crimes or oversaw those crimes, I should say, get? Well, today they got 2.69 million dollars on the way out. On the way out, was that person banned from um, activities in banking? Was the organisation that he represented deregistered and stopped from running their business? How on earth is there any comparison between what this legislation seeks to do to unions and the way this government treats big business order, their mates? Order. Order. I don't Senator Wong, Senator Rennick, Senator McKim, I'll come to you next. There's only been one government speaker so far, so I'll go to Senator Birmingham, then I'll come to you next. Senator Birmingham. Well thanks, Mr President. The first thing the Chamber needs to bear in mind is what's the question before the chair at present? The question before the chair is to provide more time, more hours to have a debate. And what are the Labor Party doing at present? They're opposing even having the time to have the debate. That's what we've got from this opposition. They're actually opposing sitting back later tonight and sitting back later tomorrow night so that we can have the debate, so that we can give them additional hours, should they wish, to actually debate the issues in this legislation. And why are they so damned opposed to having this debate? Why are they so hysterical about this argument? Why are they fighting tooth and nail every step of the way on this issue? Well, of course, because it's all about the people who put them here. That's the case when it comes to those opposite. It's not the Australian voters I'm talking about, Senator Smith. You're right. It's about the people who pull the strings, who put the Labor Party here, which are those who determine their pre-selections, those who determine who are the Labor Party candidates. And that is the union puppet masters who are there, who choose each and every one of those who sit opposite, whether they come from a union background or not. In the end, they have to get the endorsement of the trade union movement to be able to be the Labor Party candidate to even get on the ballot paper before they even get to this place. And that is, of course, why we're seeing such a reaction from those opposite. Why, though? Why, you would have to ask, would they want to stand up for a bunch of law-breaking law -breaking officials who undermine the integrity of good union officials who do good work? Because that's the thing. There are many good, decent union officials, full of integrity, Senator Keneally, full of integrity. I actually met with some, I met with some last week, Senator Farrell, at your instigation, as I am more than happy to acknowledge the trade union movement has good people within it. But they are brought down. They are brought down by the dodgy operators and by the lawbreakers, who think that it is just a price of doing business to break the law consistently. And that is, of course, what the CFMMEU does so consistently. $16.5 million in CFMEU fines have been levelled over recent years. And what's the reaction of the CFMEU? It's just the price of doing business. They pay the fines and they keep breaking the law. That's what happens. That's the attitude they take. And that's why we've brought these reforms to bear because there is a cost to that law-breaking activity. That cost 
is that construction activity in Australia costs a damn sight more than it should because of the disruptive behaviour of the unions. Indeed, estimates are that construction project costs are driven up by around 30 per cent thanks to the law-breaking activities of certain trade union leaders and certain trade unions. That's why we're cracking down on this, because the current penalty regime clearly doesn't provide a deterrent. It clearly doesn't provide a deterrent to those who think they just keep breaking the law, where they think the answer is, we'll break the law, we'll keep breaking the law, we'll pay the fines, it doesn't matter. So you create a new penalty regime to make sure we change that behaviour, to encourage people simply to abide by the existing law of the land. That's what this is. This isn't some great big new workplace relations form dis reform, despite what those opposite are suggesting. It is not that at all. It is not that at all. It's a measure to simply try to get unions to comply with the existing laws. That's all it's seeking to do, trying to get trade unions to comply with the existing laws. It is a measure that we took to the last election as a government. It's a measure that we introduced into the House of Representatives way back in July. It's a measure that's been before a Senate inquiry, which received 67 written submissions, uh, had 78 uh, different witnesses who appeared before it. There's been lots of scrutiny, and now we bring it to this chamber to debate it, and those opposite hysterically oppose even having the debate. Senator well, our government is proud to Senator bring this on for debate. We're Senator proud to respect the democratic processes of this country by giving the Senate extra time to debate this legislation, and we are determined to also make sure that other people in this country have respect for the law of the land, have respect for our existing, trade, for our existing workplace relations laws, and that we actually have all of those in the workplace relations systems operating to those laws because the penalties are sufficient to encourage Order. them to do just that. Senator McKim. Well, thank you, uh, President. This is uh, an outrageous and egregious abuse of the processes of this Senate. The government has completely failed to make the case for urgency here. But what I do want to say, having pointed that out, is that the legislation to which this motion applies is nothing less than a charter of rights for corporations. A charter of rights that will actually act as enabling legislation for big corporations to continue to exploit workers in this country by the mechanism of attacking the representation of Australian workers. Citizens don't have a charter of rights in Australia. We're the only liberal democracy in the world where citizens don't have their rights enshrined either legislatively or constitutionally. Workers don't get a charter of rights in this country, but it looks like the big corporates are going to get their charter of rights. Now, there are 23 million reasons why the government is pulling the wrong rein here. And those 23 million reasons are the 23 million admitted breaches by Westpac, by one of our big banks in Australia. And by the way, that is coming on the back of numerous breaches by the Commonwealth Bank in the past, breaches of national security legislation, breaches of counter-terrorism legislation. There were even payments in the latest Westpac breaches that related to payments for child exploitation materials, pedophile materials. And yet here's the government coming in because presumably they've done a dirty deal with some parts of the crossbench to get this perniciously named ensuring integrity legislation through the parliament. This is a draconian attack on workers in Australia, a draconian attack on the representatives and the unions who represent workers in this country. What we don't need now is a further crackdown on workers to go with the crackdown on civil society, to go with the crackdown on people who want to express their political views by participating in peaceful and non-violent protests. What we actually need in Australia is a crackdown on big corporates who are polluting this environment, who are destroying nature, 
who are exploiting their workers. That's what this country needs, not yet another draconian, ideologically motivated attack on workers and their representatives in this country at the behest of the big corporates who donate, donate so effusively to the deep pockets of the Liberal National Party in this country. So the Greens will not be supporting this motion because this motion is to enable the passage of bills that are fundamentally anti-worker, that are fundamentally anti-democratic. And I'll make you a prediction. I'll make you a prediction. That 23 million breaches by Westpac, I don't think we're going to see Westpac deregistered as a result. I'd put my house on the fact that Westpac won't be deregistered, and I'd also put my house on the fact that we won't see criminal charges laid as a result of those 23 million breaches. We will see some fines for sure, but no one will be imprisoned, and certainly none of the big banks are going to be deregistered for enabling pedophilia and for enabling terrorism in this country, because that's what is at stake here. But now, this government wants to bring in legislation that will provide a fast track to deregistration of workers' representatives in Australia. Make no mistake, colleagues, we are living in a corporatocracy in Australia right now, a corporatocracy that is resulting in the devastation of nature, it is resulting in the breakdown of our climate. It is resulting in wage stagnation. It is resulting in intergenerational poverty. And it is resulting in the massive exploitation of workers in Australia. The Greens won't be supporting this motion, and we will not be supporting the legislation to which this motion pertains. Senator Rustin. Okay. All right, so she can see Senator Yield. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Senator Rustin. Thank you, Mr. President. We do laugh on this side of the House that this bill is called Ensuring Integrity and that the government is seeking to disrupt the hours of the Senate in order to have a debate on something called Ensuring Integrity. This is a government and a prime minister who runs from integrity at every opportunity. And we see, we see the evidence of this today. What did we see in question time? Another in the other place, another protection racket by the Prime Minister for his minister, yeah. Angus Taylor, yeah. who is, yeah. as confirmed today by the New South Wales Police Force, detectives from the Crime Command's Financial Crime Squad have launched Strike Force Gerard into Minister Angus Taylor. Let's be clear about this. The New South Wales Police have launched a strike force by the Crime Command's Financial Crime Squad into a minister in this government. Where's the ensuring integrity in the cabinet of this government? What do we see in, the play, in question time in the other place? The Prime Minister running a protection racket from Mingus, Angus Taylor. We see it here with the minister representing the Prime Minister refusing to comment on the specifics of the Angus Taylor case, but yet they have the hide to come in here and say that this bill is about ensuring integrity. This is a government that is willing to turn a blind eye, quite frankly, to what's happening at Westpac. 23 million breaches of the law. 23 million breaches. Some of those facilitating the sexual exploitation of children. Money laundering that could be linked to terrorist activity. Oh no, but they don't need to do anything about those executives. They don't need to do anything about deregistering any organizations uh, that are involved in that type of criminal activity. But for three mere breaches of paperwork, nurses, police officers, teachers, their unions, their representatives, their organizations, they can be disregistered. That is the integrity that this government cares about. Paperwork breaches by the representatives of working people, not money laundering 23 million times by Westpac. And let's not forget, this is the government that voted 26 times against a banking royal commission. 26 times. Where was their concern about ensuring integrity in the banking sector when 26 times they voted against a banking royal commission? This is a prime minister who is not interested in ensuring integrity, both in this Senate 
and in the other place, we have seen time and again the government run away from even answering basic questions about who the Prime Minister wanted to invite to the White House for dinner. State secret, apparently. We can't tell you whether the Prime Minister wanted to invite his pastor, Brian Houston, to have dinner at the White House because that's something the public doesn't have a right to know. Where is the integrity in this government when the Prime Minister can't even tell the Australian people whether or not he wanted his own pastor to come to dinner at the White House? And frankly, quite frankly, if we are going to talk about ours, and this is an hours motion, where is the concern about the integrity of this Senate? They are disrupting the Senate. They are disrupting the discovery business. They are disrupting formal business in this Senate. The crossbench, all of the crossbenchers, are not going to get the time to move their motions, to have their debates, to participate and take note. This is a, this is a government that does not respect the integrity of the procedures in this Senate. So desperate are they to ram through this week a bill that takes away the rights of working people. Let's not forget that every good thing that has come for working people in this country, whether it is the eight-hour workday, whether it is paid parental leave, whether it is occupational health and safety, whether it is domestic violence leave for women fleeing domestic violence, has come because unions have agitated for it. It is because of the representatives of working people that we have got every good thing in this country for working people, and it is this government, through this charade of a bill, that wants to rip that away. Order. Time for the debate has expired, so I'll now put the question. And the question is that the motion to suspend standing orders be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question is the motion to suspend standing orders be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Dean Smith tell of the ayes and Senator Urquhart tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 39, noes 33. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I thank the Senate. I move that a motion to provide for the consideration of the Fair Work Registered Organisations Amendment ensuring Integrity Bill 2019 may be moved immediately and determined without amendment or debate. And I move that the question be now put. The question is now that the question be now put. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that the motion be now put. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Dean Smith, tell of the ayes, and Senator Urquhart, tell of the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 39, noes 33. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. I will now put the motion moved by the minister regarding the consideration of a bill. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is the procedural motion moved by the minister be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Dean Smith, teller for the ayes, and Senator Urquhart, teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 39, noes 33. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Cormann. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. President. I move the motion circulated in my name. So the question is that the motion relating to business today and tomorrow circulated in the chamber be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Yes. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is the motion moved by Senator Cormann be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Dean Smith, teller for the ayes, and Senator Urquhart, teller for the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 39, noes 33. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. I'll call the clerk.